God, we do pray that that would be uh, true of our heart's desire to have you ever before us, that you would rule our hearts in every way. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Go ahead and open up your Bible to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 6 and 7 this morning, Colossians chapter 2. Well, this morning we're going to be looking at the first command that we've come across to this point in the book of Colossians. The first command that we found at this point. And Paul in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 2 is going to set forth some instruction for his people to whom he is writing to the Colossians. And if you remember, Paul has been sharing his personal struggles and strivings on behalf of his readers, and he tells them his desire for them in verse 2 of chapter 2 is that their hearts would be encouraged. And then in verse 4, he tells them, I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive arguments. And if you look at verse 8, Paul says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. That's verse 8 of chapter 2. Paul is encouraged, as he says in verse 5, and rejoices in their good discipline and the stability of their faith in Christ, but he wants them to remain faithful. He wants to see them press on and endure and be encouraged and strengthened, and he wants them to persevere in their faith, and he wants them to stand firm. And this was so encouraging to me in my preparation because I believe the same commendation that Paul makes to the Colossians by God's grace can be made of Grace Bible Church, of you all, of us. Paul rejoices in their good discipline and the stability of their faith in Christ, and I believe the same could be made of this church. But that is no reason to relax our pursuit of Christ. That is no reason to relax our holding fast to the truth of Christ and of our seeking to walk in Him. We are currently facing very real threats and attacks on the person of Christ, on the message of the gospel, on the mission of the church, of what is right and holy and pleasing to God, and we must stand firm on Scripture. We must press on in fidelity to Christ. And so this instruction Paul brings to his early readers is timely for us as well, and let's look at it together. Let's read starting in verse 6 of Colossians chapter 2. Paul says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Being fortified from false teaching, the church is instructed to walk in Christ. Being fortified from false teaching, the church is instructed to walk in Christ. Paul gives instruction for the church, in fact, a command to walk in him, and that is Christ. And this command is given to aid the Colossians in enduring faithfully in the face of those who would seek to persuade them away from Christ, being fortified from those who seek to delude them, as Paul instructs his readers here to walk in Christ. Now, before we unpack the components surrounding this command, let's look at the command itself. Look at the second half of verse 6. Paul says, so walk in him. And Paul uses the word walk, and this word describes one's sustained pattern of living. The sustained pattern of living. This is the step-by-step unfolding of one's life or the pattern of how one conducts themselves in their life. Paul used this same word in his prayer for the Colossians in chapter 1 in verse 10 when he talks about them walking in, walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. 
And it seems Paul's emphasis is not on the initiation of this command, but the continuance of it. It's not as if someone were not in a race and Paul is telling them to join the race. But rather, someone is in the race, and the instruction is, run, keep running. If you are cheering your child on, and the race starts, you're screaming, run, run, run. They're going, I am running. And what what you're emphasizing is, keep pressing on, keep doing this. And that's what Paul's emphasis here is for the Colossians. Walk, walk in Christ, continually do this, keep on walking in Christ. Paul is saying, let the sustained pattern of your life be for the relationship you have in Christ. Continue to live your lives in Christ. And this phrase, in Christ, here is not so much indicating the power of the walk, as Paul says he strives according to the power of working in him in verse 29 of chapter 1, but that your walk is in accordance with the person of Jesus. That's the emphasis here. In him, here is not by his power, although we know from elsewhere in Scripture, our obedience and godly living is empowered by the Spirit of God. Here, Paul is using in him to communicate the idea of in union with him or as incorporated in him. Christ is the the sphere circumscribing your walk, your entire life. Lead your lives in obedience to him. And the first half of verse 6, which we'll look at in a moment, I think brings clarity to this, but the point of this command is to let the sustained pattern of your living be consistent or according to Jesus. Remember in verse 18 of chapter 1, you can look there just for a moment, where Paul is describing the supremacy and sufficiency of Jesus, and he says, so that in him, that is Jesus will come to have first place in everything, that Jesus will be preeminent in all things. That's really what Paul is commanding for the believer here, not that Jesus would have first place in your life and then everything else will kind of come after him. So Jesus gets the first here and then I can move on to these other things, but rather that every pattern of your walk is found to have Jesus at the center and foundation of what is taking place. That Jesus has first place in everything in the believer's life. The step-by-step pattern of your living would have Jesus as the focus, Jesus as the aim, Jesus as the center. We don't order our lives and give Jesus our first, we give him first place in every dimension of our lives. How can I magnify? How can I honor? How can I glorify and enjoy and worship my Savior in everything? This isn't giving Jesus your best and then moving on to personal self-gratification, but this is giving Jesus all of who you are. Everything is to be centered around him. So, with that in mind, being fortified from false teaching, the church is instructed to walk in Christ. Now, two components of this walk that we see in our passage. First, we see the comparison aiding the walk. The comparison aiding the walk. And the comparison is found in the first half of verse 6, where Paul says, just as they had received Christ. Look again at verse 6. Therefore which again demonstrates this command is connected with his longing to see them encouraged and not deluded. Or, and then he says, as or just as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Just as they had received Christ. Before Paul even gives the actual command, he gives this comparison, helping us understand this walk the believer is to have. And he says, just as, or in the same way you received Christ. And this word, have received, is most commonly used to describe receiving the gospel message itself. And Paul is centering down here, not on the mechanics of salvation, but the moment of conversion and the object of their faith 
being a clear and fixed body of truth centering on the person of Jesus Christ. We know salvation is a work of God in Christ. Paul's made that clear in chapter 1, verse 13, and verse 22. He'll describe that more, this reality, in chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. So when he says, just as you received Christ, this isn't the common evangelical idea of asking Jesus into your heart. That's not what he's emphasizing here at all. But a spirit-empowered embracing of the gospel truth as it pertains to the person of Jesus Christ. Just as you have received this body of truth pertaining to Jesus, just as you did that, now embrace Jesus as the pattern of your living. Let your conviction and conduct be in perfect accordance with the doctrines and instruction of the gospel of Jesus. You have been saved from the domain of darkness where you once walked. Now, don't go play in the shadows, but rather walk in Christ. And Paul says, as you received, and then he puts this phrase, Christ Jesus, the Lord, your Lord. Which isn't just a throwaway phrase for Jesus, but Paul uses intentional wording. When he says, Christ Jesus the Lord, there is intentionality behind this. This construction is used only here as Paul uses the word Christ, emphasizing Jesus' Messiahship, then the personal name, Jesus, and then to describe his station as as supreme, he uses the Lord. And this construction doesn't introduce a new idea pertaining to the person of Jesus, but this phrase, Jesus Christ the Lord, was actually a direct assault on the false teaching that was being faced by the Colossians that looked to supplant and minimize and neglect and reject the reality of who Jesus is. Jesus was and is the divinely appointed Messiah or Christ and possesses supremacy and deity as the Lord and the Christian faith is entered into through the person of Jesus. That's what we receive by God's grace. He is whom we receive by God's grace. And a lot of people talk about Jesus as Savior, which he is, but he must also be embraced as Lord, as Master. If he is your Savior, he must be your Lord as well. Just as the Christian life upon entrance is about the embracing of Jesus, the Christian life as one who is in Christ produces a pattern of living in accordance with the realities pertaining to Jesus. That's what Paul is saying here. And a faithfulness in your walk will actually aid and enhance your grounding in the truth, protecting you from false teaching and those teachings that would delude you from the truth. You see, we can't be content to learn about Jesus and not have it intersect with our lives personally. We can't be content to learn about Jesus and not have him impact the daily patterns of our lives, our walk. One of our greatest aids in being protected from sinful thinking and patterns around us is to address sinful thinking and patterns within us to live in faithfulness and fidelity to the truth which we have received in Christ. And so to neglect holiness of life, to neglect walking in accordance with the person of Jesus is not only dishonoring to God, which in and of itself should be more than enough of a motivator to change, but it also opens the door to susceptibility to false teaching and potential apostasy. To accept or receive the gospel, to embrace the body of truth as it pertains to Jesus and be made alive when once being spiritually dead, to be brought from darkness to light, to receive forgiveness of sins and reconciliation to God, to have the shackles of enslavement to sin be released, and then to live as if none of those things have taken place is a tragedy. We are to walk in Christ, 
Just as we have received or embraced the truths pertaining to Jesus, we must have the daily pattern of our lives be in accordance to him as well. As we consider these truths, first of all, we're faced with the question, have you received him? Have you actually received Christ? There is an offer of forgiveness of sins and salvation found in only him for anyone who will repent of their sins, that is, turn from their sins, submit their lives to him. If you recognize him, Jesus, as the only means of reconciliation to God, you humble yourself before him in repentance and faith. If you receive the truth of the gospel, there is forgiveness of sins for you. Have you done that? If not, I would plead with you to do so. If you have not and you would consider doing so, I would plead with you to talk to one of the elders of this church, talk to the person who invited you about this reality, and and we would love, love to talk with you more about what having Jesus the Christ as the Lord of your life entails and looks like. We'd love to talk with you about that. Secondly, believer, where are the inconsistencies in you currently, in the body of truth around Christ that you received, and the daily pattern of your living? Where are there inconsistencies with what you embrace to be true about Jesus Christ the Lord, and all that entails for the believer's life, and the daily walk of your life? Where you see inconsistencies, I would urge you to repent and to let there be inconsistencies no more, but to walk in Christ. Being fortified from false teaching, the church is instructed to walk in Christ. The first component of this walk is the comparison aiding the walk. This is a helpful comparison for us, and it was just as they had received Christ's walk in him, and now being fortified from false teaching, the church is instructed to walk in Christ. And the second component of this walk is, number two, the characteristics describing the walk. The characteristics describing the walk. And here in verse 7, we see four participles that characterize this walk. They are meant to expand upon what Paul meant by this command to walk in him. These are not written as additional commands, but because of their relationship to the command to walk in him, they carry the thrust and power of the command behind them. And in verse 6, helping expound upon the walk believers are to have. The first three participles Paul shares are are rich metaphors that help give clarity to this instruction. And the first is a horticultural metaphor, meaning it is pertaining to plants. Yes, I had to look that up. It is pertaining to plants. And where he says, having been rooted in Christ, and that's the first characteristic which is found that we see here beginning in the first part of verse 7 where Paul says, having been firmly rooted. So the characteristics describing the walk, first, having been rooted in Christ, that's the first characteristic. Look at verse 7. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him. Having been firmly rooted. This is such rich imagery that Paul sets forth for us. It speaks of sending down roots, but it is in the passive voice, meaning it is something that has been done to you. You have been rooted. And the wording, having been rooted here, demonstrates that God is the active agent, and this is something that has taken place in the past. This happened, this past action happened, and yet it has brought about a continuing or an abiding result in the believer's life, an ongoing state in the present. You were at some point in the past rooted firmly, and that rooting has produced an ongoing being rooted in him that has brought about with it continuing rootedness in Christ. 
And what we see in this is that a walk in Christ is characterized by someone who was and continues to find their source of spiritual nourishment and growth and fruit in Jesus. It's sourced out of Jesus. And just consider this imagery for a moment. The slightest disruption to the trunk or visible growth of a plant that is poorly rooted can bring about catastrophic consequences to that plant. Yet for a plant that is deeply and richly rooted, it can endure much adversity and sustain and press on. And so it is for the believer. A rich walk in Christ is characterized by someone who has been and continues to be deeply rooted in Jesus. This reveals why a relationship and rich understanding of truth aids the believer in their obedience. And the order must be right. You don't pursue a walk that enables entrance into a relationship with Jesus. You don't have to fix yourself up to enter into that relationship. That is a works-based legalistic approach to holiness and reconciliation. Rather, the obedience and pursuit of holiness is the outward effect and flow of a life that is connected to Christ and deeply rooted in him. It must start with a spirit-initiated and empowered receiving of Jesus and then a pattern of life reflecting the reality of that work that Christ has accomplished in you. And then Paul adds to this imagery with a second characteristic of those who walk in Christ using an architectural metaphor being built up in Christ. Look again at verse 7. Being built built up in Christ. So verse 7, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him. This metaphor signifies Christ as the cornerstone or the, the, the foundation of the Christian life, that it is built up in him. You are rooted down in Christ and you are built up upon Christ. What a great reality for the believer to embrace and know. God is so kind to us to care for us in this way, to give us all that we need in him. Paul used the perfect tense for the first characteristic, having been rooted, which indicates this took place in the past but has an abiding, continuing result for the believer. And here he uses the present tense, which pictures an ongoing construction process in the believer's life having been firmly rooted downward, now each one must continue to be built up in Christ. And again, the passive voice points again to God as the great builder. He is the active agent in the building process. Through the obedient cooperation of the believer and constant dependence upon God, the continued life walking in Christ is made possible. And we never graduate from growing in Christ, from being built up in Christ. We should never be content with our level of understanding or our maturity in Christ. The Christian life is a life of continued growth and being built up in him, in Jesus. We should never back down from the building process God desires to bring into our lives in Christ and the means of grace that he has given to us to produce that continued growth. And Paul says, having been firmly rooted and now being built up, and then we see this reoccurring phrase again, in him, in him. Christ is the soil in which we have been rooted, like a a giant timber. The believers had their roots sunk deep into Christ and were firmly planted in him, and then the believer is built up in him. And this, this phrase in him is used extensively in 
this letter to set forth dramatic and profound truths about Christ. It was in him that all things were created. It is in him that all things hold together. All of the fullness of God's reconciling and saving work is found in him. In verse 9 of chapter 2, it is in him that all the fullness of deity dwells. In him, each child of God has been made complete. All demonic powers have been defeated in him, or literally through him. At every turn of the Christian life is the supremacy and preeminence of Jesus Christ. Now, considering just the greatness of Of Jesus Christ the Lord. Consider that we are able and responsible to make our way step by step through this life in Him. To have our walk be consistent with Christ is such a privilege, is such a gift that God would rescue us from the utter foolishness and devastation of having our day-by-day walk be about anything other than Christ and to give us the privilege, the honor of having our lives, every part of our lives, be for Christ and found in Christ. What a responsibility. Why would we ever doubt his power and his strength to sustain us and aid us in our holiness before him in light of the resources that he has granted to us in him? Have you ever felt disheartened in your sin? Why do I keep returning back to this? Have you ever felt hopeless? It's a lost cause. I'm a lost cause. This is just going to be true of the rest of my life. That kind of thinking is not consistent with the resources and the means of grace that God has richly lavished upon his people in his son, Jesus. We have everything we need to be able to honor God in every circumstance in our lives. Let us walk in him. The third characteristic Paul sets forth is the third metaphor, and that's being established in faith. Look at the middle of verse 7. So he says, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith. Paul shifts to a legal metaphor here to be established. Established, this word here at times is used to describe what is legally guaranteed. It carries the idea of a, of a guarantee or a validation or a confirmation to confirm or validate and thus establish it as being true. And this is a a continual reality enabled by divine involvement. This, This strengthening or establishing is in your faith. This being validated or confirmed is in your faith. The Colossian believers are validated or confirmed and thus established as truly in the faith. That is the point here. As they matured and were rooted rooted in Christ and built up in Christ, there were obvious changes to their lives and evident expressions of their new character and obedience to Christ. And through these transformational changes, God confirmed through outward expressions that they were truly in the faith. The case was set forth in their Christian conduct and pattern of life, which has been rooted in Christ and built upon him, that they indeed do belong to Christ. And are indeed in the sphere of within the faith, it has been unquestionably established by the pattern of their lives that they belong to Jesus. And this is a true gift as we press on in our walk for Christ, the benefit for our own conscience to be established in the faith as we press on in the daily patterns of our living. Do you have this? Can you say this? And this isn't the first time the Colossians are 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 hearing these things, are being encouraged with these truths. Paul says, just as you were instructed. Do you see that there right after the phrase, and established in your faith? He says, just as you were instructed. 
This seems to be pointing to all three of the realities of the characteristics just set forth thus far, most likely having been taught by Epaphras. He taught them not only doctrines, but how to walk in those doctrines, and Paul is encouraging them in the same, and then Paul wraps up with the last characteristic here at the end of verse 7, and it is abounding with gratitude. Look at the end of verse 7, just as you were instructed, and overflowing or abounding with gratitude. Overflowing, this is to excel in gratitude, to abound in gratitude. And this is to be a continual reality. This is now the only characteristic in the active voice, meaning that you are the primary initiator of this. We are to overflow or abound with thankfulness. thankful heart captivated by and preoccupied with what we have in Christ. There is a temptation and propensity to focus on what we lack with the thought that gaining this thing will aid me in my personal holiness. I'm not all that I should be in Christ because of these things around me not being what they should be. I'm not doing this because others around me aren't doing that, or I'm not growing in Christ because my circumstances are such and such. And we grow in discontentment, which breeds sin, yet the reality is our call is not to fixate on what we perceive that we lack, but to actively thank God for what we have and to press on in our patterns of life in holiness. And so we must consider how much thought have we given to what we wish we had versus gratefulness that we cultivate for what we have received in Christ. This is really profound to consider the implications of this. Do you you realize that unchecked discontentment and ingratitude make fertile soil for false teaching and deception? That's sobering. That's so sobering that discontentment and ingratitude can make fertile soil for false teaching and delusion to infiltrate our lives. And yet in Christ, we are never at a lack for things to give thanks to God for, both in relation to him and in other believers. It's not that we... We look at all the wrongdoing of those around us, but I can still be thankful for God. Now, we are to overflow in our lives with gratitude. And that spans to God himself and giving praise to God for his church, for those believers around us whom he is using to encourage and strengthen and build us up together. The Christian life is to be rooted in Christ. He is everything for the believer. Our hearts, our minds are to be grounded in Christ. Our strength flows from Christ. Our devotion is to Christ. And this is such a gift from God that we would be able to walk in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Everything, everything about the Christian life is to magnify and glorify Jesus, and everything about the Christian life is a gift from God for the believer. There is only good found for the one who is walking in Christ. There is nothing about this instruction. There is nothing about the instruction of Christ that brings a lack of what is good into our lives. We will never walk in Christ and regret it. Walking in wisdom and obedience to Christ always ultimately brings good for the child of God. And this is just such a kindness from our Lord that we can press on, that we can walk in Christ, and yet we know that each step forward as we walk in him is not a testimony to us, but it is evidence of Christ in us. And for that, to him alone be the glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gospel, 
We thank you for Christ Jesus, the Lord. And Lord, we pray for your help that the daily pattern of our living would be in Christ, that we would glorify him, that we would honor you, that we would enjoy him. And Lord, that we would be faithful before you. We need your help. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this truth. I pray that we would walk in it as we seek to honor you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.